All right. Thanks, guys. Thank everybody for coming in and joining us. Uh, I am Troy Miller, and my guest tonight, our pres presenter, is Joshua Sommerfeld. He's going to talk about some of the macro amazingness that he does. Um, this is an IE PPV general meeting, basically. So when it's safe to get back together, we're going to be doing this at the spaghetti factory with beverages and plates of goodness in front of us while we watch somebody stand up in front and walk around and shake hands. And, but for now, we're going to do it here. Joshua, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us a little bit about your craft, your macro craft, and also dive a little bit into the Twitch community and Discord where you spend a lot of your time. Um, for those of you that don't know, you know, Joshua does a lot of uh, streaming on Twitch. So the education, the experience with, with Joshua doesn't have to end tonight. So Joshua, go ahead. Well, thank you guys for having me. Um, so, uh, as Troy said, I, I am a, a, a photography educator on the Twitch platform, uh, and we have linked that all, uh, already, and we'll link it again. But um, pretty much every night, about 10.30 uh, p.m. your time, uh, well, Monday through Thursday, um, I am on Twitch um, streaming most of my post-processing um, and, but also just answering questions, um, getting, uh, getting involved um, in the photography community, helping, uh, helping beginners learn and grow. And so um, that's, that's really, um, really what it's about for me. Um, I, I am, I, I'm online pretty much for only two reasons, education and community building. And um, I started a uh, community on the Discord platform called The Web um, because I photograph a lot of spiders. Get it? <laughs> uh, but <laughs> but uh, um, I was pretty much frustrated uh, with most online communities. Um, I, a lot of beginners come into photography and their first, uh, their first experience with a uh, with an online community is a Facebook group or um, or some such thing where um, which I don't know if you guys have been on any of those but they, they're some of the most toxic places um, you can imagine um, people are crucified just for asking a question or, or um, not knowing somebody or if some some gatekeeper deems this person's work inferior um, they just trash them you know it's it, just a terrible terrible place to be and I, I wanted to uh, provide the antithesis to that a, a place where um, creatives of all skill levels are welcome to learn and grow from each other because I, 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 I feel like n nobody supports creatives like other creatives um, people that are not not in the arts don't understand what we do and they don't understand our, our thought process. And so uh, with the understanding that as a, I am not great as a content creator. I'm, I, I can't sit here and just teach everybody, meet everybody's needs, pr crank out content. I've, I, I've got a real job. Um, but by putting in place a community where creatives can help each other, I don't have to. There are, there are very experienced content creators, creatives, photographers, 3D artists, painters in that community. And we're all just there talking to each other, supporting each other, asking questions, answering questions. Um, I support other streamers. Um, if you are in my community and you are also a Twitch streamer, my bot shouts you out. Um, I provide places where you can link things that you're selling. If you have presets that, you know, or that you're selling or giving away, you can link those. You know, there's, it's just a one-stop suite of resources um, for people to, um, to learn and grow from each other. So that's, that's, um, that's why I do what I do. Right. And that would be your discord is where that big community meets and uh, your streaming is on Twitch. Um, I've got a, uh, I've got a, a, uh, uh, 
I just totally my my brain just <laughs> QR code. <laughs> I couldn't think of what it's called. Uh, if you point your phones at that, you will have all of Joshua's links, and you can track him down and you can follow him. I'll also be throwing some links into the chat where you guys can uh, go and follow him later because his his uh, skill set is vast. And his, his um, knowledge is, is really amazing. And he did, creates a lot of amazing work. And it goes from 3D art to photographing scary reptiles to macro insects and everything in between. So um, I'll be throwing that into the chat. And just so, just so you guys know, at the end, uh, if, if Joshua still has time, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, allow everybody to turn on their microphones mm. and turn on your video. And that way we can see each other's smiling faces if you want to show us. And mm. you can talk to Joshua. You can ask them some questions verbally if, uh, if it's too hard to kind of form them in the chat. Um, if you do have questions for Joshua as we go along, mm. throw them into the chat. I'll watch them. And if it's timely, I'll, 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 I'll pop in, I'll interrupt, and I'll ask Joshua. He may see them on his own and answer them. If not, we can always get to those mm. at the end. So with that, sure. uh, Joshua, the show is all yours. Sure. And I did, before I, before I really get started with the program, I did want to add that in that in that list of links, I, I fully understand that many of you may not be familiar with the Discord platform. Um, I did include a very short two and a quarter minute YouTube video on uh, what Discord is and how it works. Um, so if you guys want to look at that, it does a very good job of, of explaining it. And of course, I am available. My email's in there. And, and, and as Troy said, I'll be here after the presentation, as it were, um, if anyone has questions about it. But um, just getting started, um, what I'm here to do is uh, pretty much just to give you guys an intro into uh, one of my favorite genres of photography. Um, I uh, really, really enjoy um, macro and close-up photography of live animals. It's a very, very specific subgenre of macro. Like, I, I'm not... Uh, I'm not uh, in, in my uh, studio with a microscope. I'm not photographing dead. And I, I have a very um, firm line against photographing dead animals um, other than prey animals. Um, so this is a, a very, very specific thing that I do, uh, macro and close-up of, of live animals only. Um, but as far as my photography background, um, Troy did mention earlier that I'm, I'm also a 3D artist. And um, that's uh, what really got me into photography. I, I, I started um, uh, rendering 3D models. And um, I realized um, as, I, as I got better and better at that and, and got better at manipulating the different settings, that a lot of those settings mirrored what we see uh, what we as photographers see on our cameras, things like um, um, shutter speed, aperture, you know, ISO, you know, all things that are very, very familiar to us. And so I just started uh, studying photography, just reading photography magazines and books just to get better at 3D art. And then, hey, side effect, I got into photography um, and I got my first digital camera, my very first digital camera in December of 2017. So I've really only been uh, shooting a little over four years now. Uh, no, yeah, that's right. Someone will tell me if I did that math wrong. Um, but uh, it was the Canon EOS Rebel T6. For those of you outside of North America, that's the 1300D. Um, and I just mainly got started sh um, shooting zoo animals. Um, that's really all I did. Um, you know, all I, um, I just went to the zoo. Um, I've always liked reptiles, always been into bugs and um, just got, just got started, started doing that and just accumulated gear and got better practicing over time. Um, but this this genre of photography really stuck with me um, for a, a very specific reason. As you look over my body of work, um, 
you'll find a lot of animals that are historically or traditionally misunderstood. Um, animals that get a bad rap. Um, and the interactions with human beings are negative because of this, largely because of these misunderstandings. Um, kind of mirrored m the way I view myself. Um, you know, I, I've always felt like nobody really gets me. Um, you know, always I feel out of place. And so uh, I identify with a lot of these animals. And, and my thought was kind of, well, if I can post this picture of a spider or a, or a wasp or something, and I can make somebody go, huh, that's cool. Or they, you know, take a second look. Well, hey, maybe, maybe there's hope for me after all, right? Um, so I guess a good start would be to define just what is macro. And um, it might interest you guys to know that about 90% of what you see build as macro photography, including the vast majority of what I do, is not technically macro photography. Um, most of it is technically close-up photography. Now, close-up photography is generally defined as any, any type of photography that closely frames a subject. I mean, you can zoom in with a telephoto, you could just get really close. Um, anything, anything that gets you, really gets you in there. That's, uh, that's, that's close-up photography. Now, macro photography is a specific genre of close-up photography in which the subject is shown at what's called one-to-one -one or life-size magnification. Now, what this means is the subject is as big in the frame as it would be if it were sitting directly on top of the sensor. So, and that's at the lens's minimum focusing distance. So if you had a one-to-one -one, uh, one -one lens or, a, or a, uh, a setup capable of giving you one-to-one -one magnification and you have a minimum focusing distance of let's say 10 centimeters, if at 10 centimeters, you were to focus on a ruler with the left end of the ruler at zero, knowing that a full frame sensor is on average 36 millimeters wide, the right edge of the frame would be at 36 millimeters. That's, that's one to one magnification. And two to one magnification, the right edge would be at 18 millimeters, if that makes, makes sense at all. And then another genre, uh, an even further subgenre would be microphotography or photo microscopy. This is photography in which the subject is shown at at least 20 to one magnification. This is often taken through microscope objectives or, or um, crazy uh, rigs of, uh, of lenses. A, a lot of what you see um, uh, Don Kamarech could do is photo microscopy. Um, I don't do any of that. Um, most of what I do falls within um, close-up and macro work. Um, you're not really going to be doing uh, uh, photo microscopy of live animals. It's uh, generally not practical. They won't sit under the microscope usually. Um, so macro photography requires uh, pretty specialist gear. Um, so to talk a little bit about that, um, the most ideal um, setup would be a true macro lens. Now, this is a lens that has um, a very, very close minimum focusing distance and gives you at least one-to-one -one magnification. Um, the vast majority max out at one-to-one. -one. Some, there are a few that will go up to, say, five-to-one. Um, or more, but generally um, most macro lenses will give you up to one to one or two to one magnification. Um, I, this is the most ideal option because it doesn't require 
um, any extra gear, no special adapters usually. Um, uh, it focuses more smoothly. It's a little easier to get a lock on your subject. Also doesn't cut um, light like uh, the next thing I'm about to talk about, which are extension tubes. Um, now extension tubes are, they're just tubes that fit between, uh, they fit between your camera body and the lens. So you would put the tube onto your lens mount, put the lens onto the tube. And what this does is it moves the optic farther away from the sensor without increasing the focal length. And this reduces your minimum focusing distance and increases magnification. So you can often get uh, one to one or more by using extension tubes, especially if you combine them with a true macro lens. Um, these are also a uh, very, uh, probably the most inexpensive option. You can usually pick up a good set of extension tubes uh, without autofocus for 10 bucks. Um, if you get the ones that have uh, electronic contacts for autofocus, um, they're, they'll run you maybe 20, 30 bucks. Uh, if you do go the extension tube route, I strongly recommend uh, that you get the ones um, with autofocus, with electronic contacts. Um, even though your odds are, and we'll, I'll discuss this a little bit later, but odds are you're going to be manually focusing for macro, but those electronic contacts also provide you with electronic aperture control and they pass exit data to the camera. Um, it, those are uh, kind of, at least the first one, the aperture control is very important because otherwise you'll be shooting at your lens's widest aperture all the time. Um, which is not good for another reason I'll discuss momentarily. Another option um, fits on the front of the lens, and this is called a, a close-up filter or diopter. Um, these are uh, typically what I personally consider to be one of the least desirable options because they tend to uh, warp or degrade image quality. Um, they're also the hardest to focus with, and for me at least. Um, there are, however, a couple of good ones. I, I, rec I recommend the um, uh, Raynox DCR250. Um, I don't have a link, but I'll type that in chat for you guys. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty good one, gives you good magnification, and it's uh, very, very, very minimal distortion. Um, so if you go that route, I'd take a look at it. And I believe it's only uh, 60 or 70 bucks. So it's relatively inexpensive. Uh, the last option that, uh, that I'll tell you guys about is something called a, re a reversing ring. Now this, uh, there are two types of reversing rings. Uh, one screws directly onto the camera and uh, this, this is just called a regular reversing ring. And it just lets you mount a, any lens on your camera body backwards. And um, this lets you uh, focus really close. It increases magnification. And you can get one-to-one -one magnification, sometimes greater that way, depending on your focal length. The other kind of reversing ring is called a coupler reversing ring. This, rather than fit directly onto the camera body, uh, will fit onto another lens. So you would, you would put a lens on your camera as normal and then put this reversing ring. Now, this typically screws into the filter thread. And then you would put another lens in reverse on the front of it. And you can combine all of these options I just mentioned macro lens, extension tubes, close-up filters, reversing rings to just get insane um, levels of magnification if you want to. Um, but uh, that last one, uh, the reversing ring, however, is the only one that I don't personally have experience with. As far as what I use at present, um, I am a Canon shooter um, primarily. Um, 
using primarily the EOS RP, um, say uh, in entry to enthusiast level full frame mirrorless. Um, I do about 90% of my work with the Sigma 150 millimeter F2.8 macro lens. Uh, it's a fantastically well stabilized lens, um, gives you good working distance for skittish animals. Um, can't, can't recommend it more highly. Uh, I've recently started doing uh, a lot of work with the Canon MPE 65 millimeter F2.8. Uh, this is a very specialist macro lens. Um, if you are if you are just looking into trying macro, looking um, looking into doing it for the first time, this is not your lens. Um, it's it's a it's a very difficult difficult lens uh, to use. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, most uh, macro lenses max out at one to one. Uh, on this lens, the minimum magnification is one to one and it goes out to five to one. It does not focus to infinity. So if you're outside of a certain distance, you cannot focus at all. Um, also, it's a bit like using a teleconverter in that as you increase the magnification, the, the lens actually extends and you lose light, which cuts your maximum aperture. So, um, F13 at 5X, for example, is F96. Um, so good lighting, good lighting is important. Um, I use for situations that require a tripod. This this is my tripod for anyone interest interested. It's a it's a good um, inexpensive carbon fiber travel travel tripod. Um, not super important that you remember that most. <laughs> Most tripods are okay. That's that's just the one I use. Um, as far as lighting goes, um, I use um, Godox TT600s. They're manual speed lights um, with the nine by seven inch flash diffuser softbox by Altura. All of these you can find all this stuff on Amazon. Um, but that's that's my relatively simple setup. Nothing. Uh, nothing at all fancy um, but you can do pretty pretty great work with very minimal kit um, and i'll just give you guys give you guys some tips for that um, just some general generalized tips um, and then I'll, I'll get a little more specific here momentarily um, the first one is you want to use narrow apertures um, between, I recommend between F8 and F13. Um, the thing about uh, macro photography and close-up is that we're focusing really close to our subjects. And uh, most of you probably already know that um, as you focus closer to your subject, depth of field narrows. And when you are mere centimeters from your subject, um, depth of field can be molecular, paper thin. Um, so I shoot almost all of my stuff between F8 and F13, but never, never narrower than F16. Because once you get into that territory, um, diffraction becomes an issue. And this is, uh, this is the degrading of image quality um, by light bending around the uh, folds in the aperture. Um, it's actually, if you've ever shot into a light source um, at a very, very narrow aperture and seen that starburst effect, diffraction is what causes that. Um, it's always present in every image you take, but you really, really notice it at narrow apertures because the folds in your aperture blades tighten and the light has to bend farther and more of the light bends around as you narrow the aperture. So I, I wouldn't go any narrower uh, than F16. I, I don't go past F13 unless I have to for that exact reason. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but focus manually. Um, autofocus is next to worthless at very, very close distances. Um, macro lenses tend to hunt 
the, uh, most macro lenses are able to focus to infinity. And so they have very, very wide focusing ranges. Um, and for live animals, you don't want to be, oh, I'm chasing this bee. I got him. <laughs> nope, he's gone. Um, so uh, focus manually if you can. Get comfortable with that focusing ring. Um, this is where mirrorless cameras um, have really, really been a godsend because um, cam mirrorless cameras and cameras that have live view with focus peaking, um, they make manual focusing for macro so much easier because you're not spending so much time fiddling with the focusing ring. Um, and because your depth of field is so thin, um, this is a good opportunity for focus stacking when you can. Um, now, obviously, this isn't practical for um, live, active, moving subjects. But if you have something sitting stationary, take a little time. Um, so focus stacking is a way of artificially extending your depth of field, where you'll focus at a point before your subject or wherever you want to start focusing. And just move the focus back, take a shot, move the focus back, take a shot, move the focus back, take a shot. And when you are satisfied, merge them later in your photo editor of choice. Um, and it will, uh, it will give you more of the frame in focus. Um, lastly, um, because I'm talking about live animals, there, is, uh, there are ethical considerations. Um, and I say, uh, disturb the animal as little as possible. Um, one thing uh, that we have to consider is we, when we are interacting with live animals, particularly wild animals, um, by our very presence, we are disturbing them. And so we have to make sure that we're not overly stressing or harming the animals just to get a shot. You know, no photo, uh, no photo is worth a life, um, be it a human life, an animal's life. Um, it's not worth causing harm to anything just to get a pretty photo. So uh, you use your head. Don't um, don't uh, don't disturb anything. Um, leave as little a trace as you can, especially when, when you're actually out in nature. Um, and that kind of leads me to uh, tips for active wild animals. These are things, you're out in the field, these are things that are moving, like this bee over here. Um, that bee is not sitting still. Um, it's moving around, hopping, or, um, hopping from flower to flower. Um, and these animals need special considerations. Um, the not the least of which piggybacking off of uh, what I said earlier and not disturbing the animal, approach with caution, it's especially if you are photographing the kinds of animals that I, that I do. A lot of these animals can hurt you, um, and not just your target. Um, there are if you're out in nature, there's lots of animals around there. It would really, really suck to be walking up to this bee right here and then get bit by that snake in the grass that you weren't paying attention to. Um, and I, I strongly, strongly suggest that you not approach an animal that you're unfamiliar with. Um, it's just better to not get the shot than to risk getting hurt because you don't know how that animal is going to respond to your approach. Um, which, which does lead me to my next point. Learn about the animals that you're photographing. Um, this is incredibly, incredibly important, um, even from a selfish standpoint of helping you get better photos. If you know how they're going to behave, you can anticipate what they're going to do, and you'll get better photos. But also, you'll minimize the risk to yourself, to the animal. You won't disturb them as badly. Um, so I, I strongly recommend learning threat and fear responses. Um, this is what an animal does when it, when it is threatening you 
and when it feels threatened. And there's a lot of misconceptions out there. Oh, I think I'm losing my internet. Can everyone still hear me okay? Yeah, you froze you froze for a second and then you came back kind of quick. So Oh, okay. Well, at least at least I'm back. But yeah, and there you go. A rattlesnake, for example, does what before it bites you? Any idea? Well, I was expecting somebody to say it rattles. And that would be incorrect. Um, rattlesnakes don't always rattle before they bite. Um, so that's, that's something to think about. They do, however, and most snakes do, move. There you go, Kim. They coil into something called an S-pose, which looks a bit like this. So this snake that you're looking at right here is a Western Diamondback. It is native to you guys in California. Um, it did not make a sound before it let me know that it would rather not be photographed today. So you have to be aware of that stuff. But he did, however, make that very obvious S pose. So if you are going to be out there photographing potentially dangerous animals, learn about them. It's very, very important. Uh, there are a lot of myths out there. Another one, good, good, just sticking with the snake example, um, a lot of people believe that all venomous snakes have triangular shaped heads and facial pits. Not correct. Um, the triangular shaped head has to do with where the venom sacs are. And in snakes that have triangular shaped heads, the venom, venom sacs are in their cheeks. And that's why their heads are shaped that way. But when you have a rear fanged snake uh, whose venom sacs may be farther down its throat or in a different part of its head, um, it will not have a triangular shaped head. Uh, prime examples, cobras, uh, mambas um, don't have triangular shaped heads. So something to think, but that's a good point, um, Kim, Kim Shapiro, S to strike a good way to remember that um so i've spent a lot of time talking about that point for a reason um safety first uh but moving on be patient we're talking about um active wild animals and this this is especially um important with things like bees and butterflies that are hopping from flower to flower uh, you don't get, uh, you don't get, you can't really get near them easily. Um, patience is key. Don't go chasing after them. Don't go moving because you're just going to scare them off. Um, and you're not going to really be able to prepare your shot like you want to. Um, usually it's better to wait for them to come to you. And uh, if you're shooting in some place like a garden where they're moving from flower to flower, just sit down next to a bush and just watch them for a while. Um, animals like butterflies and dragonflies tend to fly a pattern. So if you're going after a dragonfly and you scare it, just sit still. Odds are it's going to land pretty close to where it was. You know, that's that, uh, you know, that's that's learning that behavior. Um, butterflies, too, tend to fly a circle or ellipse pattern. They will kind of work on a rotating basis around flowers. 
So again, if you spook it, just sit still. Or if you can see the path it's taken, try to get ahead of it. Um, things like that, you know, don't, don't just go chasing them. Um, it's you'll, all you'll do is frustrate yourself. Um, a, another tip for active wild animals, pre-focus. So I mentioned earlier that you want to be ma focusing manually because autofocus isn't going to help you here. Well, it, it's really, really hard to focus on fast moving subjects, especially if you're doing it manually. Um, so a better practice might be find an inanimate object like a flower, put it at about the distance that you want to be from your subject, focus on that, and then rather than mess with the focusing ring, move in and out slowly until the animal's in focus. This saves you a lot of time so you're not fiddling with that focusing ring nonstop. Um, bees in particular, they only give you a couple of seconds if you're lucky. Um, uh, so every bit of time that you can save helps. And lastly, so this is a, this is a bit of a, a controversial thing, but I say use flash when you can. Now, going back to what we said about not disturbing animals, learning about animals, learn what animals re uh, don't respond well to flash and don't use flash on them. Um, don't use flash on animals that it would harm. Um, I, if you are photographing a venomous snake in the wild and you're you know, a couple feet away from it, uh, don't use a flash on it. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you don't want that animal to strike you. But generally speaking, things like bees, spiders, butterflies, they aren't too bothered by flash. So you're, you're usually okay. And this helps you fill those shadows. It helps you keep your shutter speed up when you're shooting at a very narrow aperture. Um, if you are using a flash in the field, um, Odds are you're going to be using it on camera. You want a really good diffuser. Um, that Altura 9x7 softbox that I mentioned earlier is a very, very good one. Um, but there are tons and tons of options out there. There are even tons of do-it-yourself do it yourself options available. So um, get a good diffuser so you're not um, blasting the animal in the face at full power. Um, and you're not getting really, really harsh lighting. Because, you know, remember, um, a lot of insects have metallic surfaces. Uh, and you'll get, you'll get really bad uh, specular highlights. So my, uh, my little notes here uh, minimized. So as far as stationary wild animals go, um, these are pretty, mostly when I say stationary wild animals, I'm talking about spiders for the most part. Um, but there are other things you might come across. Some snakes will sit still for you. Um, when you come across a wild animal that is not active, pretty uh, sedentary, not moving, um, still be wary of disturbing them. Um, a lot of these animals are vibration sensitive, particularly spiders. You can scare it off just by walking up to it. Um, if you are walking up to a spider web, look for anchor points to the web. You know, the, the entire web is not right in front of you. You've got anchor points that go off sometimes 10, 20 feet. Um, and all it takes is one little bump, boom, spider's gone. And then you feel like a jerk because you tore down the spider's house. Not speaking from experience at all. Um, but just be careful. Um, move, again, move slowly. Don't bump the web. But you do have um, a bit of an advantage here in that you can experiment with different angles. You're not just worried about chasing down the animal to get the shot. So get underneath them, get to the side of them. Don't just go for the straight on shot. 
take your time and see what you can get. Um, a lot of a lot of these um, a lot of these spiders are very very forgiving subjects. Um, they'll let you move around them for the most part, as long as you're not bumping into them. They don't really care about you. Um, again, some snakes are like this too. Um, I've I've run into um, cotton mouths, copperheads, water snakes that'll sit right there for me. Um, so if if you've got an animal that's like that. Take your time, but still be wary that some of these animals are potentially dangerous and uh, they could still strike you. So be wary of those threat and fear responses. If you see a snake sitting in that S pose, don't go near it. Um, and the, the, last, uh, the last set of tips I'll give you guys are for captive animals. Now, I, I'm aware that a lot of people, um, this is kind of a sore subject. A lot of people are not comfortable um, or, or don't feel that it's right to shoot animals in captivity. And that's completely okay. Um, should, you do, should you do so, however, a couple things to remember. If you're in something like a zoo um, or a, an aquarium, serpentarium, something like that, it's very, very important that you learn facility rules. Um, a lot of these, um, a lot of these facilities, um, zoos especially, um, have very strict rules for photography. Um, many of them forbid the use of a tripod. Almost all of them forbid the use of a of a flash. So, don't I? I always say don't be the reason for a policy change. Because if you show up and you do something wrong. It's not just you that your actions are affecting. You're affecting every photographer that comes in after you. So just go on the website, look up a lot. A lot of them are, are very easy to find and, um, and find that out. So having just said that, if you are allowed to bring a tripod, I strongly recommend that you do so. Um, as I mentioned um, earlier, most al uh, almost all of these places prohibit flash universe almost universally so a tripod in long exposure is often your best bet um this snake actually that you see in the image on this slide this is a 3.2 second exposure um and if you if you if you get a if you get a facility kind enough to let you do that you can you can do amazing amazing shots just by being a little patient um, using a tripod and remote shutter tyler tyler i uh is that kamara in the chat here it's like he can read my mind because the very next thing i was about to say was be wary of glass um so a couple things to answer that question um, there's a couple considerations when dealing with glass. Um, not the least of which is don't bump the glass. <laughs> if you have a tripod and you're adjusting it and you need to adjust it, ad pull your tripod back from the glass and adjust it. When you are, when you are moving in and out, put your hand up over your lens just as a safety precaution. So you're not bumping the glass, disturbing the animal, looking like a doofus. Et cetera. Um, as far as something to cover, um, sometimes I hold my hat up close to the glass, but generally speaking, you want to, am I, am I gone again? My, it looks like my internet would hiccup. Yeah, just a little pause. Yeah, you came back though. Uh, okay. Um, you want to focus one as close to the glass as possible. That will help you cut reflections. Um, if you've got a lens hood, that can help. Um, a polarizer is an excellent way to help deal with that. Um, I sometimes hold my hat or I wear sometimes a utility vest that I'll take off and hold up to help cut reflections. Or if I have somebody with me, or if I don't have somebody with me, I might grab a random passerby and be like, hey, 
stand here. Do what you got to do. Um, but that, to answer your question, that's that's generally how to deal with glass. But caution first. That that the big one is the first thing. Don't don't bump the glass. Um, that is a, a great way to disturb the animal and get you kicked out of there. Um, also, um, I don't have this on a slide, but be wary of other people around you. Uh, don't be setting up a tripod in a crowded zoo, you know, where you have people lining up waiting for you. Um, that, that's just being a jerk. Um, and it's also prohibited by a lot of, a lot of facilities. Um, and it's a sure way to get yourself kicked out of there. And uh, the, uh, I do want to point out, I mentioned it earlier, these are all, this is also a good time to focus stack because your animals aren't going anywhere usually. Uh, very, um, I think the very last thing before, we, uh, before I conclude, um, I just want to talk a little bit about post-processing, um, just a little bit about my process. Um, I am a Capture One user, and I will start uh, by editing. I edit in Capture One sessions, and I process as much as I can in, um, in Capture One Pro 21, um, as, much, as many edits as I can do there um, while I have all that raw data. Um, I will do that. Um, I will round trip to Affinity Photo for fine tuning, any, any fine tuning, compositing, anything um, that I can't do in Capture One. Um, but recognizing that not everybody uses the same software that I do, a lot of you are probably Adobe users. Um, more importantly, if I can impart, I guess, one thing about my mindset behind post-processing, it is to edit with intent. Um, this is super, super important. Um, consider where you want your viewer to look. Um, and if you're, if there's anything in your image that is pulling your eye away from where you want your viewer to look, deal with it, burn it down, take it out. Um, make your viewer look at what you want them to see without them realizing it. Um, if you watch me on my Twitch channel, um, a lot of people uh, like to point out, uh, I'm very fussy about highlight control, about specs, uh, you know, little specs here and there. Like I'm fussing over everything because all of it matters. Your viewer will look there without them even realizing it. So that's kind of my mindset. I want to bring the viewer as close to what it was like to be for me to be there as I can. And that's, that's kind of, um, that, that's just how I look at it there. And, um, all of that being said, I, I am pretty much, uh, pretty much, uh, done with my presentation. Um, so anybody has any questions i'm happy to uh happy to answer um and i just threw up my uh my links here for you guys again i, I did just put those in the chat as well joshua so that uh, everybody can click on those um thank you for that i i do have a i do have a question for you and maybe you can kind of walk me through some of this on your instagram you have an image you have an image like this can, can you tell me, uh, well, let me see if I can, I got to get back to, see if I can spotlight, there we go. And so we should be able to, be able to see that image as well. Um, can you walk me through briefly your editing process? I know that I've watched you on stream before and you sometimes spend, you know, five minutes to a half hour editing an image like this. And this is quite remarkable in how sharp it is, the highlight in the bee's eye. I mean, there's a lot of intention in this image. Um, 
just walk us through this a little bit and then I'll, I'll open up the audio and video for-, for Sure, so on this particular image, I was fortunate um, to be shooting um, at a relatively cold, uh, cold temperature. It was about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 50, 55. Um, another, another uh, uh, going back to my point about learning about animals, bees, uh, especially bees that size can't fly above 50 or below 50 degrees ish, depending on the size of the bee. So I caught this guy just sitting on a stock cleaning himself. Um, that highlight you see in the eye is from the flash. Um, and as far as um, et to edit this, um, there were some pretty significant highlights um, on the B on the black parts of the B um, that you can still kind of see. Um, spent a lot of time burning those down um, using uh, mostly using the dark and blend mode. So, a uh, uh, quick, uh, quick way to deal with um, specular highlights like that, where you still have texture, um, is just sample a nearby, uh, you know, make a new layer, set the blend mode to darken, um, start your opacity between 30-ish percent, um, and you can fade it in uh, as needed, and just paint over, sample a nearby color and paint over those highlights and that will give you that look like that you see on the bee's head, his, um, its leg, part of its abdomen, all those were near clipped highlights um, that I was able to recover simply by using the dark and blend mode. And then from that, uh, from then on, I just, uh, a very, very light vignette. Um, I, I, I always say in my streams, anybody that's in here from my Twitch community is gonna laugh. And I say, don't beat people over the head with your vignettes. Um, a good vignette draws the eye gently to where you want the eye to look and a bad vignette makes you look at the vignette. And unless your photo is a photo of a vignette, you don't want that. Um, so if you look really carefully, you can see where the highlights on the bee's thorax and on that stalk of the flower in, in the immediate area where the bee is, those are brighter than the surrounding highlights. That's by design. So you gently look there without even realizing that your eyes being pulled there. Um, I also spend a lot of time burning down highlights in the background. Um, if you go um, diagonal into your right from the bee's head, you see a little variation in the shadow there, you'll see like a dark, dark green, you see a little bit lighter green. In the raw file, that green was really bright. Um, I burned that down deliberately and all at different levels. So it's all, all about highlight and shadow control, gently pushing the viewer where you want the viewer to look. Right. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, we got a couple questions in the chat. I know you can see those, right? Sure. From Alicia, Tyler. Okay. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, Joshua, why don't you go ahead and address those questions? And then what I'm going to do for everybody is I allowed you mm -hmm. to turn on your video if you like, so that we can see your smiling faces if you want us to. And I'm going to allow you to unmute yourselves so that uh, we can have a little hangout and some dialogue. And uh, But we'll let, we'll let Joshua answer those questions. So everybody can unmute yourself. Uh, Joshua, go ahead. Um, and we'll just kind of work our way through those last set of questions that are on there. Asked uh, when it comes to subject matter, what is my favorite animal to shoot macro and why? Very easy. It, that last uh, image you just pulled up, the Eastern Carpenter Bee, that is, that is um, by far my favorite subject. Um, I love bees. I think they're beautiful. But I, I also love that they're challenging. They're challenging to shoot. They don't sit still, usually. Um, they're very, very difficult to shoot. But when you get a good shot, it's so rewarding. Um, and, you know, it's kind of from a, a, a philo philosophical uh, a philosophical standpoint, um, I, I like the idea of... Uh, you know, these animals have such a short life, but they have, they, they're born knowing their purpose. Kind of wish I was too, you know, and, and I like the idea that I take a creature that has about a two week lifespan 
and make it immortal uh, with my work. So it's kind of, you know, uh, stuff like that. That's, so that's kind of why those are my, my favorite subject. Um, Tyler asked um, how I deal with micro movements and stacking. Um, generally speaking, I don't. If the animal moves, the entire process is thrown for me. Sometimes, so, as far as focus stacking goes, now sometimes I can uh, recover one of the brackets and say, hey, this is a pretty good image on its own, um, and just go with that, and I don't stack. But yeah, generally speaking, um, if there's uh, any movement at all, uh, within reason, uh, the the stack is thrown for me. Now, some software, um, Photostock, uh, Photostock, good night, Photoshop has a uh, limited uh, ability to de-ghost uh, and account for movement. Um, Helicon uh, is another piece of software, um, which I highly recommend if you're bracketing more than a handful of photos at a time um has um some ability to re uh, uh, address movement so i i have a direct message troy from from one of my community members saying that uh my cam or my screen is black that they can only see you i don't know if that's the case for anybody else um but yeah so generally generally speaking if there's movement i don't uh, i don't the stack is thrown for me um let's see who am i missing have yeah, i no, heard of a... uh, uh, i'm sorry uh for Go, anybody that's having um display issues i know that a couple people have had display issues i think it's probably connection as we've been going through i've been pinging back and forth to people all over and for the most part we're getting a good stream it is recorded so whatever you don't get to see here uh, i will definitely have a video available in about a week or so and then i'll let joshua know and he can share it with the community and everything so yeah yeah go ahead joshua all right so um richard asks um have i tried or heard about modified zooms with the front element removed from macro greater than one to one i'm not familiar with that personally no um but that would be interesting to look into I, i'm not depending on the lens uh that may or may not help i would imagine uh because the, uh, some lenses are built differently, but no, I, I, I know nothing about that. Um, my process for dealing with specular, Gary asked if I, uh, if I could go over again, my process for dealing with specular highlights. So if, if it's a specular highlight where you still have um, a reasonable level of texture available, um, you can just make a new layer in your uh, photo editor, uh, Photoshop, Affinity Photo, what have you, set the blend mode to darken um, and either sample a nearby color or use the clone stamp and just brush over it at, um, start it at say um, 30 to 40% opacity because you don't want it overrode, overridden, pick a word, completely. <laughs> Um, you still want to be able to see the texture and, and you still want there to be a highlight. Um, in the case of the, the, the bee Troy just brought up, it would look completely weird if that entire bee were jet black and there was a catch light in the eye. So fade it in till it looks right. Um, and I, I didn't mention this earlier, but if it's a situation where the highlight um, has little to no detail, frequency separation. Um, right. I, so I, what you're doing, Joshua, is that you're like, like in this area right here, if you can, I don't know if you guys can see um, on my pointer, like right mm -hmm. here below the eye, um, that might be a blown highlight. And what you're doing is you're grabbing darker detail from somewhere else nearby and you're dropping it in uh, with a new layer or a brush setting with the, with the, um, uh, the, the, what am I, what am I looking for? The blend mode <laughs> right, set right. to darken. Yeah, yeah. And that's also a great way to open up highlights too, right? To bring up to bring up the highlights. So sure, sure. If you were um or if you were trying to um dodge um dodge up a certain area, that process works in reverse with the light and blend mode. 
Um, but if, if it's a situation where you have next to no detail or I have next to no detail, I just, I use frequency separation and then clone the texture layer over. And then I'll do something similar with the color layer. Um, uh, I'll clone over a separate area. Sometimes I'll use the dark and blend mode um, while I'm frequency separating so that it kind of matches up. Yeah, very cool. I I do know that Joshua spends an awful lot of time making sure that all of these images are perfect. Um, you've got to watch him on stream to really appreciate the time that it takes to go through and fix these. I mean, even uh, even with the spiders, <laughs> he's, he's, he goes in and if you can see an eye of the spider, he's fixing it, right? He's going in and finding the highlight and making sure the highlight is perfect. And it's the kind of intention that we, we should all endeavor to put into our images, whether they're landscape or, um, you know, I see Craig Stampley. So, you know, whether you're photographing a model or you're doing architecture, you know, you got to look at each thing and, and pour, some, pour some time into that. Uh, I want to bring up another image. So uh, I'm looking over here at your Instagram. So I'm just going to warn anybody that isn't, that isn't really sp- uh, friendly with spiders or doesn't really want to see spiders, I'm going to bring up a spider here in a second. Um, and I'll leave it small. I'm not going to, I'm not going to bring it in super big. You guys can spotlight me if you want. Um, but tell me a little bit about, about this, this spider shot in that was the background already that dark? Uh, was it, was it lit like that? Or, you know, how much of that is, is captured there? How much of it is post-processing? So oftentimes I, I shoot a lot of animals um, on a black background. Um, and a lot of times I do um, actually mask out the background either by hand or through um, um, a piece of software called Topaz Remask, um, which is fantastic for complex um, cutouts. However, in this case, um, no, that, that is that way. Um, because uh, I was shoot, uh, this spider is about the size of a pencil eraser. Um, and I shot it with the, uh, the Canon MPE 65 millimeter um, at 3x, uh, at 3 to 1 magnification. And I mentioned earlier with that lens that as you increase magnification, um, the level of light decreases badly. Um, it's, it's a lot like using a teleconverter. So with this particular instance, I'm shooting at um, three, I, I don't know what the actual conversion, what it works out to aperture exposure wise, but I was shooting at F13 at one 200th of a second. So ambient light is underexposed to the point of non-existence. Um, and the lighting on the subject is with that Godox TT600 speed light on camera with the nine by seven inch Altera softbox. And then in, in capture one, I just push down the shadows even, even further. So what little detail there was, was blacked out completely. Um, push up the midtones. That, that's my secret for getting that really, um, really crunchy high contrast look is to treat the midtones as if they were highlights and ignore the highlights almost completely. So I push the shadows down, push the midtone sharply, sharply up, and that's how you get um, get that sharp, like Ilford film look um, that you see in this image. Um, and then I just uh, little tidying up things, cleaning up um, of some of the specks in the web that would pull the eye away, burning down pieces of the web that would be distracting, burning down um, little specks that were on the spider. Um, using that uh, burning process for highlights that I described earlier on the on the legs, um, and playing up the catch lights in the spider's eye. Um, just uh, most of those are drawn on. Um, a couple of them are real, but for the most part, I drew them on in post just to make them look even. Wow! Yeah, I just I just love I just love the eyes right there. You know, they're just looking up at you. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I, is this is this the image that you sent me? No, but oh. um, Ali, uh, Alicia, who is here in the chat, has that hanging on that very image hanging on her wall. Oh, nice. Um, but actually, if you look at that image, there are six more eyes. 
besides the two that you can really see. If you look just below the two that you can see, you can easily see two more catch lights. Actually, to the left and right, you can see four, actually four that you can see because you have two pairs of eyes in front and two pairs on each side. Wow. Yeah, it's it's just so cool. It's it's you know macro or uh you know close up photography. It, it's mm -hmm. just one of those kind of things where you get to see into a world that we don't normally get to experience. You know, these are things that we just walk by, mm -hmm. and it's um, all around you. It, it and, and I just I just have to stress like this is not easy stuff to do, right? Like I've I've been a photographer for thirty years. It's all I've ever done, and then during COVID, I'm like there's a big spider behind my spa. Like I should photograph that. They Sound suck. logic. <laughs> They're all crappy. So, well, thank you, Joshua. Hey guys, any questions? Anybody got any questions? You can unmute yourselves. Feel, feel free to, to chime in and talk to Joshua. Okay. <laughs> I thought it was right, great. Yeah. I loved it, even with the spider. Yeah, really cool. Especially with the even spiders. with the spider. You notice I kept the spider small. <laughs> In yeah, the my daughter was spiders. Awesome. great. Yeah, the the spiders the spiders don't bother me. Um, there, there's so many. I'm just kind of looking at your Instagram feed over here. You know, I'm just kind of like scrolling through. There's just so many really cool images in here. Um, you know, like your wasp. You know, and I know that there's a lot of work that goes into each one of these. So what I would really encourage everybody to do is to check out uh, Joshua's Twitch channel uh, where he streams live, like he said earlier, pretty regularly. And if he's not working on 3D, he's working on one of these kind of images. And he he's not kidding. He will answer any question you want, um, whether it's trivia about the Andy Griffith show or Star Wars trivia uh, or it's the, <laughs> or it's about his photography. <laughs> it's Actually. there. Yeah. Yeah. All important uh, stuff. How close right. were you to that snake, that diamondback or I think it was a oh, diamondback. The one, the one that struck at me. Yeah. That one. Yeah. That <laughs> one. About two feet. Oh boy. There. Okay. Uh, hold on. I, ass I hold assume on. they get into the S just for getting into like a striking pose to have more longevity on their or reach, I should say. It's like a spring. Spring, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and my mistake was thinking, oh, he's facing the other way. It's fine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dwayne has a question for you, uh, Joshua, in the chat. Sure. Uh, I photograph a bug. I don't know what it is. How do I track down and find out what it is? Uh, Google Lens is my number one way of identifying animals I'm not familiar with. Um, I'm not sure if it's on iOS. Um, I know they were planning to add it, but I'm not sure. And Google Lens on Android has since been integrated into the Google app itself. But you just hold up my, I just, you know, hold up my phone camera and Google Lens says, hey, I think it's this. And I look at it and go, yeah, okay, that looks right. And sometimes it's completely wrong. But that's, that's the number one way I find out. Um, I also often find out um, by, if I misidentify um, an animal, uh, Twitter lets me know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they're not nice about it. <laughs> no, I know you but, do a lot of keywording and organizing of your of all your creatures. So I know that you take that seriously. Um, so very cool. Yeah, it's it's pretty important to me to be able to find my images later. So uh, and to 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 search, be able to search by what I'm looking for specifically. Like if I if I want to find a specific type of spider, I need to be able to type that in and um, and have it come up. So that's so why I'm I'm at your right. I'm meticulous about my keywording. Yeah, and and anybody who's not doing any kind of keywording at all, uh, just consider being able to go back even the most basic levels you know car tree uh you know a location you don't really think about it until until somebody comes to you and says 
hey, Mr. Stampfley, I would really love to do a showing uh, with some of your car images. I really love your car images. Could you could you send me something? I need something in a few days. Yeah, and and Easy. I want to and I want to give you and I want to give you ten grand for that image you shot three years ago. Hope you can find it. I can find it. <laughs> I can't find it. So I, you know, it, I, I'm like, oh my gosh! Like I know I have a lot of moon photos, and I know I have some infrared moon photos. Where are they? Just in a little. Folder. I, I don't know how Lightroom does it, but a little bit of a plug in for Capture One or a plug for Capture One is they uh, Capture One lets you save keyword groups as presets. And like, like a lot of Capture One presets, you can stack them. So I might say um, I have keyword groups for, for venues, for um, locations, for um, going from general to specific. Like I might say, oh, I'm shooting in Riverbanks Botanical Garden. And I shot a bee. That, and this is a carpenter bee. And those are keyword groups that I've saved as presets to save time. Yeah, Lightroom yeah. lets you do that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, Kim wants to know if you've ever gotten bit or stung. Yeah, a lot of mosquitoes. A lot of mosquitoes <laughs> out in the swamp. Nonstop. But no, never by anything. Never by anything really dangerous. No, I, I'm very, um, I'm very learned about the dangerous animals. I mean, I've waded into the water with alligators. Um, I've been centimeters away from cotton mouths that, not, that are in the wild. Um, I'm very comfortable being able to, with being able to recognize their body language. Um, but I, I've, never, um, I've, I've never even been stung by a bee since I was a little kid. <laughs> Not wow. since I was a little kid. I mean, so. But Troy, do we want to start working on uh, Joshua's obituary now, or? <laughs> I know y'all, y'all, y'all can etch that on my tombstone. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm very comfortable <laughs> with critters. No problem. But yeah, I think it makes sense. It's fine. <laughs> well, it's like it's what Josh the other way. Said. It's like what he said earlier. Um, know your environment. And, and be aware of your surroundings, right? Like that is, that is super important no matter what type of photography we're doing. Whether you're standing on a cliff, near a cliff, near somebody else's tripod with a camera on it, uh, you know, you gotta be careful all the time, all the time being careful, so. Yeah, and I, I kind of glossed over it earlier, but, but I'm dead serious when I say, remember that your subject is not necessarily the only animal in the area. Um, you, it is very, very, very possible to be walking up to a spider to take a picture of a spider in a web and get bit by a rattlesnake. I can you know, see that, you know, be, we get that hyper focused tunnel vision, like, oh my gosh, I got to get that sunset before and we're just trampling through bushes, not mm -hmm. thinking about what's in there. Or like you said, <laughs> Climbing up. Happy to say, Joshua, that I'll never get bitten by a rattlesnake down here. I'm that good. No, you'll <laughs> you'll just get bit by everything else that lives there. <laughs> so, yeah. so Alex, Alex just asked, is it true that they can jump and strike the length of their body? Um, not usually. Um, now a lot of them, what you may be thinking of, uh, most of most of most snakes can strike uh it varies per species. Um, let me say that up front. But for the most part, most of them can strike one to two thirds of their body length. Um, what you may be thinking of is, is some snakes, if you pick them up by the tail, which I don't recommend, um, <laughs> have the ability to strike back over their body. Um, so if okay, you noted. are if you are doing that it was nice knowing you but i told you keep so. that in mind <laughs> <laughs> no me. usually for for most snakes it's about a third of their body length but uh, again it depends it's very very um dependent on species some can mo do more some less right <laughs> 
Right. So right. get that yeah. Google lens, go one foot from the thing, see what it is and see what it can do and then yeah. test it. Yeah. 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 You know, we, yeah. we, we laugh, but yeah, it's, I'm, I'm deadly serious about that. Don't, don't approach an animal you're not familiar with. Don't be, don't be stupid. You know, that's, that's how, that's how you get hurt. And then from, from my standpoint, you know, as a, as someone who really loves these animals, people retaliate and kill these animals because, uh, because of their negative interactions with humans. But nine times out of 10, these negative interactions are the fault of the people involved, not the animal. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Joshua. Thank you guys. If you have any last minute questions, you got like a few seconds to start, uh, you know, speak up or type it in there. Otherwise, uh, let's wrap up, let everybody get to going back and, uh, whatever it is you guys are doing on Wednesday night. One quick one for you, Joshua. What's on the bucket list to, that you need to shoot that you haven't shot yet? I want to travel. Like I want to shoot, um, animals in the wild that i can only see in zoos here um like uh australia is a big one on my bucket list you guys have a lot of stuff that i want to see i want to shoot saltwater crocs in the wild nile crocs in the wild uh which you don't have in, in africa but um in australia the sydney funnel web i want to i want to shoot i want to shoot the funnel web um, I just want to travel and, and see all the animals that I can't see here. Bali, I could possibly send you a funnel web. I'll package one up for you. Go for it, man. <laughs> Let's not. Let's not do that. <laughs> to everybody else in the chat, guess what your accessories do now? <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. like Bali, Indonesia has some amazing spiders. Yep. Um, that I'd like to go see. I, I just want to shoot anything and everything I can. Makes sense. Makes sense. Well, hopefully, hopefully you get to do that, Joshua. And then we get to, I'll get to live vicariously through all of your work and how close Absolutely. you get to these creatures. Cause uh, although I really love your work and you know that I'm a huge fan of your work, there's, there's a lot of these creatures that I don't even, I barely want to get close enough with a 200 millimeter. Right. You know, it's just, it just, it doesn't work for me, you know? And like you said, they're mostly misunderstood. I, I need to learn them better, but uh, I hope you get to, to travel and photograph those things. So, and I know Craig would love to have you come visit him. So, or, or come <laughs> out to South Carolina. I know a good guide who knows all the swamps. I'll, I'll take you out there. And he's South never been to so you're yeah. safe. Exactly. That's, I just, you know, put, you know, put the person I'm guiding in between me and the animal, and it, it's fine. I, I don't get bit. <laughs> That's called you have the buffer to get zone. <sighs> right, right. Oh my gosh. All right. Thank you guys. Very Thank cool. everybody for being here tonight. Go check out ieppv.com and oh, Frank Peel's popping in at the last minute. Uh, go check out ieppv.com and you'll be able to see what other events that we have coming up uh, the first Wednesday of the month and the third Wednesday of the month. I think next general meeting is image comp, which is, which is coming up in 30 days from today, right? Which yes. means image comp opens up in one week. So that's a good thing. And check out Joshua's work. Go, go, go visit him on Twitch. Go watch him do a stream and um, ask him lots of questions. He loves that. So again, thank you, Joshua. I appreciate all of your knowledge and your amazing imagery. Everybody else have a safe and wonderful rest of your evening and your week. And we'll catch thank you, you Joshua. Thank right. you, Joshua. Glad, Very bye. good. No problem. Glad. Thank you guys for having me. You should put up that uh, SWAT, the uh, scan okay. code again. Oh, I can do that. Sure. And I know it, it's, it might be a little late for you guys, but I, I am streaming tonight. I believe it's 1030, 1030 PM your time. Oh, very nice. All right. There you go. Thank you, Joshua. Thanks everybody. I will catch everybody later. Everybody get be safe and have a good evening. <laughs>